I think I hit the tipping point when we had the first death for coronavirus in this country. And then from there, it went to, there are 10 deaths today, 100 deaths, 500, and it just kept going. As a doctor on the front line, I'm telling you, we did not have enough PPE. We were reusing masks. Ethnic minority groups were disproportionately affected. Why? And pregnant doctors and healthcare workers, why weren't they being protected? We need to make sure that people know what's really happening. We need to ask the why. We have a new name for the coronavirus. The World Health Organization has officially called it COVID-19. In the spring of 2020, health workers in Britain were dying from a fast-spreading new virus. Reports of widespread PPE shortages are stirring fears, with growing numbers of doctors and nurses infected and even dying. Doctors and nurses were working in hospitals without enough of the protective equipment they needed to do their jobs safely. One of the latest uh, NHS staff victims of the pandemic was a pregnant nurse working at the Luton and Dunstable University Hospital. Mary Adjapong, a 28-year-old nurse expecting her second child, was one of those health workers who lost her life to COVID-19. Mary Adjapong died in hospital just moments after giving birth to a baby daughter. But this death of a black health worker went beyond the tragedy of a family or a community. It exposed something crucial to understanding today's Britain, how it's shaped and governed by two defining forces, racism and neoliberalism. What happened to Mary Adjapong was a symptom of a deeper malaise. And it compelled one doctor to stand up for health workers on the front line of an unprecedented public health emergency, bringing Mary's death to the doorstep of the British Prime Minister. So where is everyone? Come and look, there they are. Hi. So I was outside number 10 in April. It was exactly one week after Nurse Mary had passed away. I was there alone. It was a one-woman protest. And it was strange because I was stood outside a beautiful building, outside Parliament in Westminster. You would have never thought that we were in a pandemic. And our leaders were walking down these same roads every day. I was walking into A&E every day, and that was a difference. Do you think that's why there was such a disconnect between what you were experiencing on the front line and the policies that were being made? Absolutely. Our ministers had no idea what was happening on the shop floor, but I could see the body bags. What was it about the death of Nurse Mary that resonated with you so clearly? I think when I heard this story, the first thing that went through my mind was that what if this was my mother? What if this was my father? We talk about equality all the time. It's championed by our politicians, it's championed by our leaders. So why are we just gonna sit in silence and watch this innocent nurse pass away and just leave a family behind? Okay, so it says here that Mary Adjapong grew up in Ghana with her mum and she came to live with her dad here in Luton when she was a teenager. My dad was actually born in Luton. It's one of those places that was really transformed by the immigration story in the UK. She then studied nursing at Luton University and she became a nurse at the hospital there, the hospital where she died. Oh, wow, her dad died of COVID just 10 days before her. And she died in the hospital where she worked? Yeah, she did. Oh, God. 
It seems like a lot of the people who died at the early stages of the pandemic were from ethnic minorities. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, whenever you turn the TV on and they were shown reports of the death toll from COVID, exactly. it was the health workers, the doctors and nurses, and they were all black and brown. They were all from minority communities in Britain. But not just health workers, right? So many key workers, yeah. like public transport workers, people who work in, in shops, delivery drivers. It's like there's this disproportionate reliance mm. on certain groups to do certain jobs, like, like Mary's dad, because it says here that he had been a teacher in Ghana, but that he took on manual work when he came, when he came to Europe. And I guess that's true for so many people who were coming from, from the developing world to the yeah. West. Yeah, it's, it's the story of how the West was made. It, you don't have the, the, you know, the world that we have now without immigration, and particularly in Britain. You know, there is no modern Britain without immigration, without those people who came from the Commonwealth, from South Asia, from the Caribbean, who did all the work to help rebuild Britain. You know, it's, it's the story of my family. Mm -hmm. My grandfather came here from India in the 1950s to work in the factories and foundries to rebuild Britain after the Second World War. Right. And all, what he learned to say in English when he came here was any job, any shift. Hmm. And off the back of that, my parents came here in the early 60s and again worked in factories and foundries. And, you know, here I am from there. The story of Britain is a story of immigration. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, 100%. In different forms. And even with my parents, they came in the 90s. They were refugees from Somalia, so it was a bit different, not economic migrants. They both studied back home, but when they came here, it was the same kind of jobs that were afforded to them. So your dad came here, and what did he do here? He so he's a delivery driver here, right. but back home he'd studied and he was teaching, right. and then the war kicked off. And right. here they are. That's, that's similar to, to Mary's dad's story. Mary's dad's story, similar to, you know, what Mary grew up with. It's why Mina Alviz found herself protesting, right? And it's like the government policies in this country are set up or not set up to help minority groups. Uh, you, you, when you look at some of the policies, particularly since the advent of neoliberalism, mm -hmm. you know, from the late 70s through the 80s, you can see the kind of political and economic shifts mm -hmm. that have led to the kind of state that we're in now. But you, you can't get away from, from the race story or the immigration story particularly, you know, tracing that back to empire. That moment is key, that right? Moment. That moment when yeah. you go from empire to post-imperial state and it's like the inequality is embedded at that very moment when people from the Commonwealth come to Britain in the 1950s. By the early to mid 1950s, because of the demands on the economy from recovering after the war, there are emerging labour shortages. And so the government starts to invite people from the British Commonwealth to immigrate to the UK to fill in labour shortages in factories, in transport and so on. There's direct advertising happening in the Caribbean and some parts of Asia to say, well, we need people to come and drive the buses, to drive the trains, um, to work in the underground, to work in the health service. The NHS literally is the most colonial institution we have. Like, it literally would be impossible um, to have staffed it without um, nurses and doctors from overseas. But there's overt and hidden discrimination in the labour market, which means some kind of work some people can do and some people cannot. The only way that that can be done is to have this belief in, in racial superiority, in this hierarchy of whiteness. The way that white supremacy works is white at the top, is black at the bottom, and this hierarchy in between. And that's kind of how capitalism works. It says, your job is to be a cleaner, your job is to be a driver, your job is to be a banker, and it's colour-coded. Racial prejudice and racial hostility were commonplace for non-white immigrants in Britain, from governing the work they did to attacks on where they lived. Black and brown communities did, however, fight back. Standing up against violence on the streets as well as for better protections, more rights and greater equality would, in the 1960s, force new government legislation banning overt discrimination. The first 
Race Relations Act was brought into law in 1965, making it illegal to discriminate against anyone based on their race or colour. Three years later, however, the UK Parliament passed the Commonwealth Immigrants Act, shutting Britain's doors to people from non-white nations of the former empire. But people from New Zealand, Australia and Canada, countries with majority white populations, were still allowed in. Britain's immigration policy was itself coded by colour. Immigrant labour serviced Britain's booming post-war economy that saw rising wages as well as increased provision in welfare, housing and education. But the boom wasn't to last. By the late 1970s, the global economy was in crisis. In Britain, state mismanagement and crippling trade disputes brought production and growth to a halt. Power cuts and refuse left uncollected on the streets, all too symbolic of a nation in decay. Far-right groups like the National Front blamed immigrants, old and new, for the country's plight. National Front is white men's front! Join the National Front! And pushed for wholesale repatriation of all non-white people, including all those born in the UK. <laughs> In 1978, a year before a general election, Britain was a fractured and fractious place. Uncertain and up for grabs. The official residence of the Prime Minister of Great Britain, number 10 Downing Street. The glittering prize for the leaders of the country's political parties as Britain turns to the hustings. The workers are warned against a conservative takeover, led by the first woman Tory leader, Margaret Thatcher. In an election that would decide the fate of Britain, Margaret Thatcher, leader of the opposition Conservative Party, looked to claim the advantage by claiming the ground occupied by the far right. People are really rather afraid that this country might be rather swamped by people with a different culture. And you know, if there's any fear that it might be swamped, people are going to react and be rather hostile to those coming in. Thatcher speaks to that sense of being under attack, and very cleverly she says, all of these feelings of insecurity and experiences of dispossession, because Britain in the 70s is not a lovely place to live. Unemployment is starting to rise, um, industries are collapsing, there's a lot of uh, strikes. There's raging inflation, there's a loss of economic growth. She says, you know that way you feel horrible? Maybe it's because of this, these swamping others. Without quite explicitly saying it, she makes the whole sense of economic crisis seem like a racial crisis. Her Majesty, the Queen, has asked me to form a new administration, and I have accepted. Margaret Thatcher's election victory in 1979 proved the value of playing politics with race. Now, supported by a band of ideologues called the New Right, she would lay out a radical new vision for Britain based on a revived ideology called neoliberalism. That was the heart of the, the Thatcherite project. Neoliberals were in a very small minority, and they started to form also national uh, level think tanks, like in the UK, the Centre for Policy Studies, the Adam Smith Institute. But they were regarded as, as totally fringe, and they were not really listened to at all, until you get a political entrepreneur like Margaret Thatcher, who is interested in decisively resolving the crisis of the 70s. And these ideas are sort of sitting around, and they provide the policy templates that she then implements climate of opportunity and enterprise. Less tax, less regulation, more flexibility, more freedom. Those will be our guidelines. She says you have to dial down political institutions. You have to roll back democratic accountability. You have to open the market to the, this idea of market forces, which means that you curtail social forces. And a big part of that is absolutely discrediting the idea of the welfare state. 
Thatcher was willing to go whole hog and tear up the post-war consensus. Basically meant defeating the trade unions, which she regarded as the enemy within, and then restoring the conditions for businesses to make profit. So it is left to the market to decide which areas will flourish and prosper, which people are going to get richer and which ones poorer. Britain's inner cities had long been poor and home to the majority of black and brown communities. Brixton was a predominantly black Caribbean area of South London, blighted by joblessness and chronic underinvestment. In 1981, crime was rising. Young black men targets for police harassment suspected of criminal activity, regardless of proof. Blacks in Brixton claim they are singled out by police on the streets, subjected to body searches, and often accused of having stolen anything valuable in their possession. What happens in Brixton in 81, they decide to swamp the area with police, they stop and search hundreds of people over it. I mean, it's ridiculous. Everybody's getting stopped. There's some really rotten police down Brixton. They just, they just sold you up and bring you down the station and batter you up for nothing. And the community just had enough. They just said, no, we're not, we're not going to take this anymore. The local people say it was the inevitable explosion of steam by a community which feels the police have been picking on them recently. And it sparked off three days of rebellions where people just wanted to take back the streets, could keep the police out. And then it spread across the whole country. This was the Liverpool suburb of Toxteth. Things start happening elsewhere happening in Birmingham, happening in Liverpool. And this is before social media. So people are just watching the mainstream telly that isn't telling them the community point of view, but they understand something historic is happening. Another city burns. This was Bristol. And again, the trouble started in a poor urban quarter with a large number of black residents. <laughs> It caught the zeitgeist, if you like, because it was a, it was a, an explosion of lots of tension that had been building up for years. That's a scary moment for the British racial consciousness. And sadly, it gets used to feed into British racism, saying, well, look, we told you these people are animals. They are not um, open to being civilised. They will never be British because, look, they bring this violence with them. And that's how it gets narrated. You have what we call new racism, where there is a very distinct shift from kind of the older forms of you can just be openly racist. So it becomes about culture, it becomes about family. And this is the new right. And it is through think tanks. There is, you know, like the right wing press basically push the ideology of keep Britain white, but make it sound post racial, sound like it's not about race. It's just about family values, it's just about good economic sense. But really, it is that politics of racial resentment, just giving better PR. There's this whole architecture of how you get to neoliberalism, which really is based on this fear of the underclass, which is this deeply racist idea uh, about cultural racism of, of, of poor black communities. But it was cloaked in this so-called return to kind of Victorian era, social values, tradition, nationalism, flag waving, uh, and even imperialistic rhetoric. And then the state itself was reconfigured to make it less democratic and participatory. We start to see the creation of independent regulators, quasi-autonomous non-governmental organisations, or quangos, and various public-private hybrid bodies to which authority, decision-making, regulatory power is shifted. In the post-war era of the command and control state, 
there was outright nationalisation of various sectors which were then privatised, which is to reduce or remove democratic control and oversight, because then it just becomes about private decision making and private profit. You also try to weaken the role of organised labour. The stage had been set for Britain's most bitter industrial dispute. So we can talk about the, the miners' strike and the defeat of various trade unions. There's also deregulation, which means the removal of barriers to business doing what it wants. So you shift manufacturing away from Britain, where there are relatively high wages and welfare provision, to low-wage economies. And alongside that, you've got the massive deregulation of financial markets, domestically and internationally. So obviously big business benefits, because they are the ones best poised to exploit new market opportunities. And then, because of the, the growth in the services sector of the economy, you get the emergence of a, a kind of a burgeoning new middle class who make often very large sums of money under the new market conditions. They may be keeping one eye on the latest prices, but the city's dealers don't seem to be holding back on their favourite drink this Christmas. And then there are some people who systematically lose out, that lose their jobs, lose the stability of rising welfare, of public housing and so on and become a kind of permanent underclass because there was a deliberate decision made to basically throw these people to the wolves. Attacks on public services and industry wore away at Britain's struggling communities. Jobs were lost, state support cut. A diagnosis of why unemployment has trebled since 1980 is not hard to find. Idle machines on the shop floor speak for themselves. The government was facing growing anger from a white working class left exposed to a new, harsh, neoliberal reality. And at the same time, beleaguered local authorities in multiracial cities were trying to counter the harsh reality of racism by supporting their constituents with whatever funds they had available. For Margaret Thatcher and the New Right, Local government support for anti-racism was at once both a problem and a solution. This is the key thing to say, look, anti-racism is a problem. That's, that's what's keeping back poor white people. Not because of Thatcher's economic policies, not because of austerity and neoliberalism. No, it's because, one, there's too many immigrants, and two, we've given them too much stuff. We've given them too, too much of a head start. And so now you're, you're falling behind. If you think about what Thatcher does, you know, embracing Britishness, wrapping herself in the flag. This is the early expression of the culture wars. So what happened and what happened with Thatcher then? Well, Thatcher has a long run of it. She has 11 years. And throughout that time, she is constantly building on these neoliberal ideals. And John Major comes in as her successor, but he doesn't break from what's happened. So actually what you get is more privatization. You get more quangos that replace a lot of government agencies. And this continues for his whole seven years. And as you're having this big neoliberal overhaul, what you get is this increasing disparity between rich and poor. Lots of people start to get left behind. But there were some groups that prospered, right? Some ethnic minorities were able to live the neoliberal dream. <laughs> yeah, you, you always get winners and losers in, in any system like this. There were you know, certain South Asian communities and, and people who made money. They're in many ways the exceptions to the rule. There are exceptions to the ideology, but there was a fragmenting of communities as well. Right, it's just like it breaks everybody up, right? Totally. Everybody's kind of fighting for the same resources. And in, at that point, because multiculturalism is an absolute fact of life, the local authorities are dedicating some funds towards multicultural policies, towards anti-racism or whatnot, which the new right are fighting, 
But then when you've got a fragmenting of South Asian communities into, you know, faith groups of Sikh, Muslim, Hindu, you've got the African Caribbean community now, different African communities and Caribbean communities. And everyone's jostling for the same, same funds. All jostling for the same pot of money yeah. and they're all competing against each other just to try and not even get ahead, just to try and get even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whereas before it was like this idea of political blackness, right? There was this idea of political blackness in the 60s and 70s. So everyone who was not white fell under this. Same exactly. umbrella. But that then gets broken up. And some people say it's a good thing because there's no one racism. There are different racisms against different groups. And at this same moment, you have somebody like Tony Blair coming in and you had this like big election campaign in 1997. And the slogan was, things can only get better. So I guess the question is which kind of route he took and whether things really did get better for people in this country. Margaret Thatcher was once asked, what is your greatest legacy? And she said, New Labour. Tony Blair was a successor and heir to Thatcher. He reconfigured the Labour Party quite fundamentally. So Labour Party's traditional commitment to public ownership of democratic control over the economy, that, that is abandoned. And the main role for the state is to correct for market failures and try to include more and more people into market society. It's kind of neoliberalism with a more human face, or what we might call progressive neoliberalism. Tony Blair pulled the Labour Party away from its socialist moors and anchored it to the free market. What helped paint the new Labour government as progressive was social values, such as its outward embrace of multiculturalism. No matter what people's background or their creed, or their colour. The party that can stand up for what is a great country. Thank you very much, everyone. But by 2001, standing up for the country was also being claimed by a resurgent far right, now reorganised around the British National Party, the BNP. The BNP's rights for white slogan had obviously struck home. We've got to do something to stand up for ourselves, and they're the only people to help us. Having formed its base in the south of England, the BNP looked to make gains further north, in the places left behind by the neoliberal revolution. The far right started to have demonstrations in places of concentrated Muslim residents. They chose some places in these areas which had never recovered from the economic hits of Thatcherism. So Bradford, Burnley, Oldham, in which there's long-standing Muslim communities, almost all of South Asian origin, and also this ongoing economic uncertainty. So the BNP decide as their tactic to provoke a response from local Muslim communities is to say, I'm going to walk past where your sister, your mother, your auntie, your granny live, and I'm going to shout racist abuse. B -N -B -N -B -B -N -B -N -B and it kicks off a series of violence across lots of northern cities. Much of the blame lies with right-wing agitators who've been stirring up trouble in recent weeks. Our youth will not tolerate any form of racism from these kind of people. Here a man gave what was interpreted as a Nazi salute. As Asian news began to home in on him, he ran. What happens is the police come and what they do is they criminalise the Muslim communities. There's huge numbers of arrests of young Muslim men. David Blunkett, Home Secretary under Tony Blair, had to make a decision about how those altercations were framed, you know, what kind of law they came under. That was framed as a, a racial danger, a racial danger that echoed the 1980s. The natives are getting restless again. He said, of course, the maniacs who were engaging in this are now whining about the sentences they've been given. He chose to put them under the kind of law which allowed people to have very long custodial sentences. And what happened is many, many of the young men who were involved in that went down for 10, 12, 15 years. We can see this incrementally building up. The more crime you commit, the tougher the sentence. That's a game-changer, and, and Blunkett says 
in an echo of Thatcher, it's about Britishness. It's about their failure of Britishness. The way that the government responded to this was not to focus on the fact that actually this was, this was, this was far-right racists causing problems in these towns. The focus very much was on, well, no, there's something wrong with Muslim communities. They're, they're too closed off. They're, they're living parallel lives. They're not like the rest of us. Couldn't possibly because of economic marginalization, um, where you see particularly um, Pakistani Bangladeshi children and young people, massive high unemployment issues, huge problems in terms of racism and open diet racism. It couldn't be any of those issues. It must be because there's, they, live to, they live these parallel lives, they've been taught this terrible religion, and they're not integrating. The response to the riots in 2001 is really just a, it's, it's, it's textbook from the response to the uprisings in, in 81. It really much is the same playbook. Decades of racial discrimination in housing and education had kept South Asian Muslims segregated from white people. It was a far cry from New Labour's wishful celebration of Britain's multiculturalism. Britain was still dealing with the fallout from the Northern riots when the September 11th attacks in the US shocked the world. The Blair government offered its full support for America's so-called war on terror that followed. However, in 2005, Britain too came under attack. The London transport system was bombed by four British Muslim men claiming retaliation against the war on terror. Now, all Muslims in Britain were being asked if their faith was compatible with their being British. Around the same time, just as one established minority community was being painted as aliens within, a new group was being welcomed into the country. Tony Blair opened Britain's doors to migrant workers from Eastern Europe as the European Union grew larger and larger and the needs of capital grew more and more demanding. In 2007, Blair reluctantly stepped aside for Gordon Brown. And a year later, the financial deregulation put in place during the neoliberal revolution of the 1980s helped bring about a credit crisis that almost broke the global economy. Gordon Brown was forced to bail out failing British banks with British taxpayers' money. Brown's time as prime minister didn't last long. He was voted out in 2010 and replaced by a new conservative prime minister, David Cameron. Cameron set out to lead a country still reeling in the wake of a financial disaster and a coalition government that had set its sights on one thing above everything else, reduce the nation's debt. The neoliberal orthodoxy is that you must push your overall levels of debt down. That's the basic neoliberal policy in response to the global financial crisis. And so this is where we get austerity from, the idea that we must slash public spending in order to pay our debt down. So the austerity had a very disproportionate impact on the poor, on ethnic minorities, because many people in ethnic minorities are also poor. The government's austerity program had increased insecurity for many people whose lives were already financially insecure. And then in 2016, Britain went to the polls to decide if it should stay in or leave the European Union. Let's make sure that June the 24th is Independence Day. Independence Day. More than half of those who voted agreed, and Britain left the EU. Now, that insecurity brought about by austerity was given as the reason many white working class communities, those left worse off by neoliberal reforms, had voted for Brexit. The truth, however, was something else. Analysis carried out after the referendum revealed that Leave voters were more likely to be middle class, financially stable, and living in the least ethnically diverse parts of the country. Brexit, it seemed, was driven less by economic insecurity and more by cultural fear. Immigration really was 
at the heart of Brexit. Yeah, of course. And I think for a lot of ethnic minorities, it was all about race as well. I remember very clearly, it was like a very hostile time to be black, right? To be non-white, basically. There, there are a lot of studies that show that after the Brexit vote in 2016, racist abuse against non-white British people completely shot up. It's attacking those people they think are foreign to Britishness and British culture. Exactly. And the, the, the irony of all that is that immigration is a fact of life in Britain simply because people were invited here mm -hmm. from the Commonwealth to fill the gap in the labour market. Mm -hmm. And then everything after that, all the policies were about keeping people out. Mm -hmm. And immigration was all about making it harder and harder for people, especially those from non-white countries, the developing world, to come over to Britain. Right, right, but then you have this expansion of the EU in 2004 and Britain realises it needs a bigger workforce to supply its growing economy and it's more than happened, happy to open the doors and let people in, particularly, you know, from Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. Businesses like the idea of a cheaper labour force, right, because it was less money than it cost to pay British workers. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, people are happy to have cheap labour. No one's going to complain when their house extensions don't cost as much money or their childcare or their social care. Right? It's a win-win if you've got money and you're in, in that system. Exactly. But even then, resentment against these new immigrants was festering. It's not like it just kind of got left to the yeah, side. Yeah, it's always there. It was always there. Mm. And especially the fact that they were Eastern European. And then at the same time, you'd had a lot of Syrian refugees coming in from their civil war that was happening there looking for asylum, as well as other people escaping instability in places like Afghanistan. Do you remember that poster that Nigel hmm. Farage put out? Do you remember that whole anti-immigrant oh pro-Brexit? Yeah. Shoes and you had of people. That caravan yeah. of people, and yeah. it just said, breaking point, right? Yeah. And what he's doing with that whole caravan of actually non-European refugees is this idea of, you're going to be swamped. And he's playing into exactly the same rhetoric that Thatcher had been playing into the 80s, the idea of nobody coming over is ever going to be quite British enough. And, you know, we, we're talking about multiculturalism as though it's not an absolute fact of life in certain parts of this country. Uh, it was created by the state by inviting everybody here. Yeah. It's like, this is now what Britain is. Yeah. The British people have voted to leave and their will must be respected. A negotiation with the European Union will need to begin under a new Prime Minister. Britain's withdrawal from the EU saw David Cameron exit as Prime Minister. In his place came Theresa May, promising that... Brexit means Brexit, and we're going to make a success of it. They didn't. Her government failed and she too fell on her sword, making way for the Conservatives' chief Brexit cheerleader, Boris Johnson, with his rallying battle cry, Let's get Brexit done. Johnson would get Brexit done, but within weeks of leaving the European Union, Britain would be gripped by a far deadlier challenge. Unwelcome but expected, the coronavirus has hit the UK. The outbreak of coronavirus is now officially a pandemic. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. In March 2020, as COVID-19 spread across the world, Boris Johnson placed Britain in an emergency lockdown. The government's overriding aim was to keep the coronavirus contained. To do that, it would need to rely on the state being fit for purpose. The initial response to the pandemic fundamentally relied on a state structure and infrastructure that had been already hollowed out. The state becomes increasingly dependent on two kinds of private sector companies. One is management consultancies. So they're often brought in to help the state to reorganize services to assist in, the, in basically in the privatization process. And secondly, the state becomes reliant on outsourcing companies. So companies that step forward and say, well, okay, we'll bid to take on this part of the public services. The state becomes reliant on management consultancies to tell it what to do, to tell it how to govern. 
And it also becomes dependent on these private companies to actually run and offer, provide basic social services. But essentially, ministers were pulling on levers in Whitehall that weren't actually connected to anything. Crucial parts of Britain's state apparatus had been turned over to private business. And austerity cuts to public health spending meant that, in a national emergency, the system failed. When it was most needed, the state was unable to keep track of COVID-19, allowing the virus to spread, meaning that more and more sick people were admitted to hospital and the number of daily deaths began to soar. Attention now turned to providing personal protective equipment, PPE, to health workers trying to keep the sick from dying. It transpired that the management consultancy Deloitte had overseen the privatization of NHS supply chain, the logistics part of the NHS that supplies things like personal protective equipment. And all of these companies that had bid for these contracts and won them all failed to deliver. So there was a massive general shortage of personal protective equipment. This GP group bought their own extra protective equipment weeks ago, including reusable plastic goggles. They know they're luckier than many in the rest of the country. Now, the government did maintain a stockpile of PPE for pandemic disease. But even that had been privatised. It had been outsourced to a private company called Movianto. Their stockpile only covered two weeks' worth of use. There were serious shortages of things like visors, masks, gowns, ventilators. And almost half of the stock had expired on the shelf. It was past its use-by date. And this is why we had the terrible situation of health and social care workers having to improvise with uh, snorkels or even trash bags. And over 126 um, fatalities among these workers has been linked to occupational exposure. Here are the faces of 10 of those who have lost their lives. The first tranche of deaths of health workers were nearly all black and brown people. And it really hit home the extent to which when it comes to who will care for you when you're at risk or dying, that is still overwhelmingly racialized. There's always been this idea about there's a particular job you're supposed to do, uh, which you can track back to the 60s and e even earlier than that. Uh, think about frontline service, think about care work. And public transport, like on the buses, on the trains, like in the shops, right? Who's someone who's got to go and, st and stock all the supermarket shelves? Ethnic minorities are overrepresented in those very low paid, disrespected roles. The rise of the gig economy, which forces people to go out and work, otherwise, they have no sick pay, no holiday pay, no support to actually survive. COVID-19 was laying bare the dysfunction and discrimination coursing through the modern British state. At its heart was a 20th century ideology that had stripped the system of its power and its post-war purpose. The roots of the failure of the state during the COVID-19 pandemic go back decades. And fundamentally, it's about the hollowing out of the state, the hollowing out of the state politically and the hollowing out of the state institutionally. It's the result of a whole program of revolutionizing our state and society around the market that has left the vast majority of us less secure and more vulnerable. One of the big consequences of neoliberalism has been rampant inequality, levels of inequality not seen since the late 19th century. Health is heavily determined by your socioeconomic status. So societal inequalities manifest themselves in differential rates of disease. If you're poor, you can die up to 10 years earlier than a wealthy person. Every health 
outcome is worse for ethnic minorities and pretty much every illness. So all the things which tie into what would make you be more likely to die from COVID, we were already more likely to have those. It's this kind of perfect storm where there's not really any area of social life from education, from health, from criminal justice, where we're not disproportionately impacted. You know, you are twice as likely to be on free school meals if you're a black Caribbean. You are five times more likely if you're a black woman to die in childbirth. You are more likely to be in overcrowded housing if you're Pakistani Bangladeshi. Those are the real issues we should be talking about. But actually, when we're not, they were not talking about them because of being distracted by these culture wars around identity. We should not uh, support a demonstration that is in all probability going to end in deliberate and calculated violence. The Johnson government is really expending a lot of political energy trying to concoct a culture war around Britishness, around whiteness, and it's an echo of the Thatcherite concoction the bringing together of racist fears, homophobic fears, and nationalist fears. Britishness is defined by who it's not. And you can see very clearly it's not the immigrants. It's not black people. It's not the Muslims. And so the idea of whiteness and white identity has been absolutely essential, not just to how we understand the nation, but actually to, to what the nation is and how it works. All of that feels like um, a class race war writ large through a public health emergency. So I think going forward, we're all going to have to think about how do we organise and mobilise ourselves in a way that when the emergencies come, we can survive. If you look at how many people from ethnic minority and black communities were affected disproportionately by the pandemic. How did that make you feel? I think the, the most concerning part was that if the light bulb switched in my brain to say, okay, ethnic minority groups are more gravely affected, let's do risk assessments. Let's try and protect them even more than, than, we, than we, we are right now. Why didn't it click with our leaders? We need people to know how did Nurse Mary die? And why did she die? And why has her family been left to grieve? But these families still haven't moved on and probably never will. These families will never see their normal again. <laughs>